Hello, I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary reading. We are in week 13 of Pentecost in year A, and our commentary today is by James Boyce of 2008. We start today with the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20, and these are some really important verses in this chapter. In fact, this part of Matthew 16 is really a big turning point, more so than other aspects of uh, Matthew's gospel, that this reading today uh, marks some important moments and events in the life of Jesus and of the disciples. When we look to questions, we can see that oftentimes we are living the questions, meaning that we have lots of questions in our lives, right? And lots of questions about Jesus as well, but we often live questions and we look to questions as a way to find purpose and meaning and understanding. And so oftentimes with questions, they just oftentimes lead to more questions, right? And uh, so let's take a look at questions today and the questions that we might have upon this text. And we can also look to questions and see that they have a way of marking um, important um, moments and events in, in the life of Jesus, but also in our own lives as well. Today's listen has, a fittingly, has fittingly been acknowledged as pivotal and climactic in Matthew's narrative of Jesus, Galilean ministry. The stories to this point have repeatedly pressed the issue of faith and discipleship as the many stories of Jesus's teaching and healing have led these disciples and ourselves to expect some things about this one called the Son of Man. And now these stories are focused in Jesus' intensely direct and personal questions and in Peter's response, but who do you say that I am? There's no escape and this is no time for evasion. Peter speaks for the disciples from Matthew's gospel and the community to which it is first addressed. And certainly for us, announcing that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus confirms this confession by Peter as a mark of God's blessing and as the rock upon which he will build his church. So that just gives us a brief summary, but I'd like us to take a look at the text for this morning, Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. For one of the first times in this gospel, Jesus does not criticize or qualify Peter's disciple response as one of little faith, but instead commends it for its revelatory power. Consistent with the unique and major theme in Matthew, it is described as a mark of God's blessing, a blessing that so often defines in the companies what it means to be righteous disciple of the kingdom. It is the repeated promise of blessing that initiates Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and so grounds the message of the kingdom and its call for righteousness as a key sign of God's people. As a key signifier of the promises of God, this blessing is repeated at key points in Matthew's narrative. It is a mark of God's blessing when those who respond in faith are contrasted with those who take offense at Jesus' preaching. I think it's also interesting to note that as Peter responds to Jesus, Jesus acknowledges that this is not, this revelation is not of the flesh, but the revelation that Peter makes in his confession is it's coming from God. The Holy Spirit is upon him, giving him this insight or has been giving him this insight as well. Secondly, the story recognizes Peter's central role as a representative of the disciple community blessed in its confession of faith. Here for the first time in Matthew's gospel, the titles of Messiah and Son of God 
are joined together in acknowledgement of Jesus' identity. When we look to the Gospel of Matthew, names are significant. And at his birth, Jesus' name is interpreted as signifying that he will save his people from their sins. Now, in parallel manner, the confessor's name is given significance. His name is Peter, and Jesus says, it is on this rock that he will build his church. Discipleship is named, founded, and commissioned in this confession. Master and disciples are bound together in identity. At the end of the gospel, Jesus will commission these disciples as representatives of a new community to go into his name and to make disciples of all nations. And as we look to this new community that Matthew now uniquely calls attention to, on this rock, I will build my church. Matthew alone of the gospel writers uses the word translated here as church and links it with talk of the kingdom. Church is the community of disciples and the kingdom of God are intimately bound in Matthew's conception of Jesus's mission, which from this point on in the story is linked to Jesus's passion, death, and resurrection. This linking of this community's existence to Peter's confession would be significant enough, but in addition, Matthew uniquely calls attention to the signal and central mission of this community. This community is endowed with the promise of a rich gift, the keys of the kingdom, which both here and especially in 1810 to 35 is identified as this community's invitation and mission to exercise the power of forgiveness in the binding and loosening of sin in the name of God. One cannot emphasize that invitation and mission too, too strongly in Matthew's conception of the continuing call and responsibility of discipleship. But questions remain. So let's take a look at some questions. What would it look like for us to claim such a blessing and to have such imagination as to join in this confession and community as Peter speaks on our behalf? What if we were to see ourselves too as called and blessed in our encounter with God's Messiah? And I think at times we do see ourselves as called and blessed as we encounter with God's Messiah. Oftentimes we see this on an on an individual basis, but what would that look like corporately? What would that look like for us as a church to see ourselves called and blessed as we encounter with God's um, Messiah? And what if we were then to know ourselves to be called by this promise and given a new identity as disciples and ambassadors of the kingdom? In other words, what does it look like to really live out this calling as we profess and confess that Jesus is our Messiah, he is the Son of God, and that um, this is revelatory to us in our day because every, every generation is always asking the question, who is Jesus? And so what does it look like for us to live out this love that Christ brings to us? And what if then we could catch a glimpse of what it means to be part of this new community, authorized and empowered as agents to exercise the task of forgiving and welcoming in the name of a God who desires mercy and not sacrifice. And I think as we look to this question, I think that we oftentimes go in and out of this. We live this, we actually do, but yet at the same time, we catch the glimpses. Um, we are fully living into this new kingdom and the task of forgiving and welcoming in the name of God who desires mercy is really important for us as Christians. People are looking to us to do that. And when we forgive someone, that is a gift from God. It's not something that I feel I do on my own. It's something that God has given me uh, the power to do that through the gift of the Holy Spirit, through our baptism. Um, forgiveness, um, I don't think I can rely on myself to forgive. I have to look to God who has forgiven me. And then through the gift and power of the Holy Spirit, we can forgive others. What requires of us, though, is a trusting, a trust in the gift that God has given us so that we can extend his forgiveness to others. I hope you have some time to ponder on that this week, and maybe God will place on our hearts someone whom we thought we had forgiven, and maybe we hadn't. 
helping us to realize that we are to depend on God for this. And when we do, we are made new. Blessings to you as you ponder the word this week.